Good evening, Culture Vultures. We're back with another episode of First Principles. This is a series where we bring up some books that are important for understanding the right, especially the radical right. And tonight we're going to talk about Julius Evola. And I'm just going to make sure that we are running on all platforms. We are running on Entropy right now and on DLive and on YouTube. So I want to welcome you all. Welcome everyone who's watching live and everyone who's in the chat and especially the moderators, of course. Let's go over a few links that are important. Our schedule can be found on guidetoculture.org. You can find us on Twitter, on real underscore GTK for Guide to Culture. We have a Telegram channel. You can find t-shirts, etc., mugs. You can find our friends, Eunice and Tina. All these links are in the notes below, of course. Uh, you can find our archive of previous episodes on BitChute. And you can send questions and donations to the show, support us through Entropy. So if you have questions, send them that way, and we'll bring them up with the guest toward the end of the live stream. Of course, another good way to help us out and support the show is to share our links so that people can find them. Not everyone has found our archive on BitChute. People keep asking me where our archive is. You can find it on BitChute. And I also want to mention uh, that I have been on a couple of Shows lately, I was on a show with E. Michael Jones, debated him really uh, last week, and I was also on Semiogog's channel. He interviewed me for a couple of hours, and yesterday I had Guillaume de Rocher and Daniel Conversano on from France. We talked about the end of free speech in Europe. And now it's time to introduce our guest. Alexander Jacob was born in Madras in India and obtained his uh, master's degree in English literature from the University of Leeds and his PhD in the history of ideas from Pennsylvania State University. His postdoctoral research was conducted at the University of Toronto while he was a visiting fellow at the departments of political science philosophy and English literature at the University of Toronto. And his scholarly publications include work on, works on natural philosophy, such as De Naturae Natura, a study on, of idealistic conceptions of nature and the unconscious from 1992, Atman, a reconstruction of the solar cosmology of the Indo-Europeans from 2005, Brahman, a study of the solar rituals of the Indo-Europeans from 2012, and Indo-European mythology and religion, that is a collection of essays from 2019. He has also published in political philosophy, among other things, uh, Nobilitas, a study of European aristocratic philosophy from ancient Greece to the early 20th century from 2001, uh, we have Richard Wagner on Tragedy, Christianity, and the State, three essays from 2019, and European Perspectives, essays from 2020. And he's also produced, translated, edited several English-language editions of European conservative thinkers, such as Houston Stewart Chamberlain, Edgar Julius Jung, Alfred Rosenberg, Eugen Düring, Charles Maurras, Julius Langbein, and some others. And finally, Dr. Jacob has also recorded piano transcriptions of Richard Wagner's Der Ring des Nibelungen, Parsifal, and Lohengrin for Manticore Press. It's time to welcome Alexander Jacob. Welcome to Guide to Culture. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be on the show. Excellent. So we have introduced you already, so it's time to just dive into the topic. We're going to talk about Julius Evola, and you have chosen to talk about his book, Men Among the Ruins. Shall we uh, say something, first of all, about who Julius Evola was? Um, this book was obviously written, I think it came out first in 1953, when Evola was 55 years old, so it's a mature work, and 
It's written after the Second World War. But can you give us a, a background of who Julius Ebola was and what the context of this work is? In, in which context was it written? Well, he was a Sicilian aristocrat, sir. And uh, he uh, began uh, curiously uh, in revolt against uh, bourgeois society by participating in modernist movements like Dadaism, uh, the art movement, and um, also interested in esoteric uh, thought and disciplines and so on. But during the war, uh, he, he certainly uh, was uh, attracted more to fascist philosophy, Mussolini's uh, doctrines, and supported him, actually. Um, and then he traveled to Germany as well uh, as a sort of ambassador of uh, the fascists, though he was not completely accepted uh, by the Germans. And um, so he survived the war and uh, at the end of it, of course, he was quite disappointed uh, by the results, uh, obviously. And uh, this is the work that he wrote, Men Among the Ruins, after the war, that uh, constitutes a, a series of reflections on uh, the past and uh, the problems of uh, aristocratic uh, philosophy in general. Actually, uh, I chose Men Among the Ruins because uh, Fascism is, in fact, uh, a direct continuation of aristocratic philosophy uh, and aristocratic um, life in general. Uh, after the First World War, the empires and their aristocrats disappeared. And so in a world without empires and monarchs and aristocrats, fascism uh, is the only uh, substitute, as it were. Uh, this is why uh, fascism is so very important for all traditionalists, because that is uh, where you start from uh, in the modern world if you want to revive the past um, uh, in contemporary terms. And uh, fascist doctrines are more clearly enunciated in Italy uh, than in Germany. In fact, it started earlier in Italy than in Germany and particularly by Mussolini's uh, philosopher Giovanni Gentile and also by Ebola. Gentile uh, wrote a systematic work called The Genesis and Structure of uh, Society in 1943 um, and then came uh, Ebola's uh, work in 1953. So uh, these are the two principal works I would say uh, or certainly the most attractive of the fascist uh, doctrines and uh, they are definitely worth reading and uh, i think of the two also ebola is a little more aristocratic than gentile first because he's an aristocrat and also because um, he has a, a less a democratic view uh, of um, society uh, a democratic view that both Gentile and the National Socialists have. Um, so um, we can talk about that later, but uh, this is the reason why I chose Men Among the Ruins and also because Ebola is popular for various reasons. A lot of people nowadays have an interest in Buddhism and Hinduism and so on. He wrote extensively on these subjects uh, following Genon, of course, who was a pioneer in this field, Orientalism. And so people know uh, his work in that direction. Also magic, I think he wrote about. So um, I think it's important to dwell on his political views now, especially because it constitutes uh, one of the few works of fascist philosophy uh, and one of the most important. Also. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. Yeah, let's talk about uh, the democratic aspects uh, a bit later in the conversation. Let's just start out in the middle of the topic um, and and with the title, what are the ruins? I mean, this might seem very simple, but let's start there at least. What are the ruins that he's talking about in the title, and and how did we end up in this these ruins? What what happened? Well, it's clear that the Second World War happened, uh, so uh, Europe was literally in ruins, and uh, more than that, of course, uh, the, the traditional world. Uh, this is the aristocratic world completely collapsed. Uh, it had already been uh, 
ended politically at the end of the First World War. And the Second World War, uh, it was definitely dead, as it were. And so, uh, standing among the ruins of this old world, Ebola is forced to contemplate the past and also to uh, point to, to the future. Uh, it's not an entirely hopeless work, as the title might suggest. He actually, uh, you know, uh, has uh, something inspiring to say. Uh, on all these topics. Uh, the book is actually not a systematic one, as I mentioned. It's called uh, Reflections of a Radical Traditionalist or something, post-war reflections, right? And uh, they are actually uh, independent essays um, uh, strung together uh, as a book. They're not uh, very logically ordered, but generally you might discern a pattern. So the first four uh, chapters, for instance, talk about the individual and the state. And then from six to 10, you have um, a discussion of the three estates, that is the worker, the warrior, and the priest, or the church, actually, he discusses. And then uh, the 11th chapter is against the bourgeoisie. Uh, the bourgeoisie he sees as the greatest enemy of the traditional world. And in the 13th, this is one of the last chapters, he talks about uh, the subversion uh, contained in the protocols, that is the book uh, about uh, the machinations of the Jews, and also about uh, the dangers of masonry, Freemasonry. And uh, so uh, that roughly is the plan of the work. So you can see that uh, you know it's, it starts with, uh, a delineation of the fascist uh, system and then ends with uh, the greatest obstacles to this uh, system and that is uh, the very last chapter so um and then uh, the conclusion is uh, thoughts on uh, a united europe so uh, that is the aim of course mm -hmm. uh, but he he thought that this collapse or the 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 decline rather of our civilization started before the second world war it didn't start with the second world war right it started with the french revolution or where does he trace right. where does he trace the, the the original causes for the decline of our civilization well he traces it uh, all the way back to the renaissance uh, where uh, the bankers and so on uh, gained ground. Uh, the Medici, for instance, were all uh, a banking family. And uh, also there's this, uh, the Protestant Reformation at the same time. So uh, he uh, locates uh, the dissolution already in the Renaissance, much, much earlier than the French Revolution. But what he doesn't uh, highlight and what I would suggest is that they all have uh, a common uh, connection to Judaism. The Protestantism is a very uh, uh, Jewish kind of religion. It's based primarily on the Old Testament. And the Puritans in particular, you know, were like a uh, uh, neo-Jewish kind of uh, grouping. Uh, they call themselves uh, a strange name borrowed from the Old Testament and lived according uh, to some patriarchal uh, rules. So uh, already uh, that uh, element, uh, the, Pur the Puritan and the Protestant element in the Renaissance is connected to uh, to Judaism. Uh, he uh, decries the Medici and the Renaissance for having, uh, you know, instituted a commercial kind of rule uh, that was not really princely or monarchical. But the Medici were not Jews, and their banking and their capitalism were quite, were quite distinct from from the Jews. So I wouldn't uh, blame the Renaissance so much as he does. And then, of course, the French Revolution, everybody blames. All conservatives blame the French Revolution. But that was also informed by Freemasonry and so on. And Freemasonry is, again, a kind of Judaic sect. Um, Masons are building the Temple of Solomon or something of the sort. So that also is connected to that. And then, of course, you have Marxism in the 19th century, which is completely Jewish, because Karl Marx was. Uh, so all of these have a common thread. He doesn't point that out. Of course, uh, 
he's constrained uh, after the war in talking about Jews in general. But I would, you know, uh, highlight uh, that common thread among uh, all of the forces of ruin. And then, of course, uh, after the communist revolution uh, comes the end of uh, the European Empire. Right. So, uh, I mean, would you say in that case that the causes of this decline are not some sort of, shall we say, organic or just uh, sort of Spenglerian? It's just like a, a, a civilization that has become tired. It's rather forces that actively are corrupting our civilization. Uh, would that Absolutely. be correct? Absolutely. Uh, he calls this an occult war and he calls these forces occult forces because masonry is somewhat occult, it's, it's very secretive. Um, and the protocols are also a kind of secretive document. No one knows the origin and the authorship of it and so on and so forth. So he calls it an occult war and he says at the end, if you want to fight this uh, in a counter-revolution, you should also become experts uh, in uh, occultism, but in a positive light, uh, in a more idealistic manner. I don't think any of this is occult. It's all patent. I mean, <laughs> what have we know what happened? We can see, uh, you know, through the history of Europe, what happened, and uh, we can see the transformations happening every day in our contemporary world also. So, um, so that that, that uh, is what he says about uh, the nature of uh, the forces working against uh, European civilization in general. Right. So uh, now that we stand among the ruins, um, what can we do about the situation? What can we? What can the right do um, in in our in our current post-war situation? Um, well, you see, first of all, uh, one needs to understand uh, what one is in relation to the rest of uh, the nation and the state in particular. All fascist doctrines uh, are statist. They are based on the primacy of the state. And this is something uh, one has to acknowledge and uh, actually develop because uh, man by himself you know, is, is useless. He will become more and more individualist. And this is the problem of Protestantism, which is an individualist religion. It is the problem of uh, liberalism and the Enlightenment and everything. So uh, how do you curtail this individualism? You have to develop uh, the personality. That, that is the great stress on personality in all idealistic political philosophy. And uh, personality means uh, uh, understanding, first of all, uh, the dimensions of idealistic thought. Uh, I, uh, you know, idealism is the opposite of materialism. Karl Marx is completely materialist. Um, idealism, on the other hand, posits uh, a priori. First of all, a world of ideas uh, that are not yet manifest, and these are perfect. And therein is contained already the idea of man, you know, with a capital M. And our aspiration should be to achieve uh, that this universal idea of man uh, that is not uh, ourselves. It's, it's not our egoistic uh, self, but something that is um, uh, yeah, spiritual, if you like. So uh, the spiritual aspect is uh, prior to any material manifestation, and this is the focus uh, of all our endeavors. This should be. Um, so when you have that large, uh, large view of yourself, then uh, you're not uh, petty anymore, and everything you do uh, achieves a greater significance. So that is uh, the importance of the focus on uh, the person. So everyone should, you know, try to develop his personality as completely as possible uh, with this, uh, you know, spiritual viewpoint. And uh, then uh, the instrument uh, that is supposed to help the individuals in society is the state. This is the duty of the state. The state is not an economic unit. Of course, uh, Ebola, all fascists are uh, you know, against uh, the economic orientation of um, society and focus on uh, the organization of society more. So in this uh, regard, the state uh, should present a, a strong uh, polity 
wherein uh, the culture of the people, the elevation of the, its population should be the main focus. The economic concerns are, are dealt with by the lower house and the upper house is the political power. It's the reverse in all democracies, as you probably know, because uh, the prime minister rules and he's only the first of ministers. Uh, and uh, from the lower uh, chamber, as it were. So um, th this is a, a reversal that needs to take place. Uh, it has to start from the top. If you are going to strengthen the state, it is the Senate in America or the House of Lords that should uh, you know, take the first steps. Uh, so um, that, that does the importance of the state because the state is not to be considered anymore as an economic unit. It is not a plaything of the bourgeoisie, the capitalists and speculators and this and that and the other. So um, that would be the reformation. And then, of course, uh, you have uh, uh, the workers. This is, of course, the large mass of people. Today, almost everybody is a kind of worker, a technocrat or something, technological worker. And um, they... Uh, are simply uh, prey to the bourgeoisie because uh, uh, the bourgeoisie control uh, all of the finances and they're running uh, a show on every stage. So um, the problem now to elevate the masses who are not so educated or um, you know likely to be very enlightened is to uh, take them away from the grasp of this third estate, so the bourgeoisie, and focus them up to the uh, higher levels of society. For that, there must be, you know, a visible uh, upper class, or upper caste. Um, and he focuses, of course, on uh, the church and the warriors. He prefers uh, the warrior class because he's an aristocrat. And he thinks the Catholic church is somewhat uh, uh, enfeebled now uh, after uh, Vatican II and that sort of thing. Um, but whatever it is, uh, the, the upper classes must always be the main focus of the state. Uh, upper estates, that is the church and uh, the aristocrats. So, um, you know, the, the state has to be reformulated in that direction. What the bourgeoisie accomplish uh, in terms of their financial uh, expertise uh, and so on, uh, is of little importance in comparison. It is only a practical concern. Uh, what the um, lower houses do is only for you know the material welfare of the people. So this cannot be uh, very important. And the workers, that is those people who are in the cities as industrial workers, as well as the agrarian, must be turned away from uh, the third estate, that is the bourgeoisie. And, and have to think of uh, levels above above these, and this is of course the main task of uh, of education. Um, but the problem is getting the bourgeoisie out of their uh, you know pivotal positions in society. Um, so that 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 is the focus of any counter revolution. It has to be anti bourgeois. You know, the communists were also anti-bourgeois, uh, as you probably know. The socialists and communists are anti-bourgeois also. The problem right. with communism uh, uh, is that it's a completely materialistic system. And so it's a kind of caricature of fascism, you see. And this is the problem. It is just, uh, it is just uh, uh, an instrument of the bourgeoisie, in fact. Um, so... Uh, it cannot be a communist state. The communist state was also very powerful, as we know from uh, Russia. But all of this is a mockery uh, of real politics, because real politics must be aristocratic and conducted uh, not by people of concern only about the material benefit uh, of uh, the people, but also the spiritual. And that can be only two castes, and that is uh, the priests and the warriors. Right. Uh, so I want to just continue about one of the things that you mentioned. You mentioned that uh, man should strive to become or, or strive toward the ideal uh, man, the idea of man, the, in the, the sort of platonic idea of man. Well, how do we know what that is? Well, uh, uh, first of all, um, 
just by inference, you know, you know that things are passing and changing and so on, but um, they don't have value insofar as they change. Whereas ideals never change and uh, ideals also. And uh, this is for that which is permanent. And this is what uh, is classical. Uh, we call things classical because uh, they have lasted for so long and will continue to last. Whereas everything else is transitory and uh, you know not satisfying. Um, so uh, first of all, it, it must be beyond yourself uh, because your pleasures are, are transitory also and cannot give you permanent satisfaction. Um, so the, the ideal man would be one who uh, you know, is, is sort of ideal and has a kind of super consciousness. Um, the aim of Hindu philosophy has always been this. For us, it is uh, taken for granted that the individual must you know, uh, 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 expand his consciousness to that of Brahman. Brahman is the supreme consciousness of the cosmos, the supreme light, if you like, first light before the manifestation of uh, the cosmos. So um, this is the endeavor of all ascetics and so on. But it is equally that of uh, the aristocratic class because the monarchs in the past were, you know, like priest kings or something. Uh, you know, in Rome, it's called Pontifex Maximus. That is mm -hmm. the title used by the Pope, actually. So the emperor had a priestly office also in ancient Egypt also. Uh, only the pharaoh conducted all the uh, all the uh, rituals and so on, uh, along with priests. So um, the, the monarchical position is a very eminent one, the spiritual one. And uh, so you need a monarchy in the first place. But uh, failing that, you can have you know the aristocratic class that have in their tradition always followed the monarch. And so the aristocrats uh, are also conscious of this uh, larger significance. This is why they represent the whole nation. Um, they're not concerned about themselves. They, you know, fight wars for uh, uh, Christianity and that sort of thing in the Crusades. So um, all of this is, uh, you know, larger than uh, your own life. So it, it's clear that uh, there is a larger dimension to ourselves than our individual. So. Right. And it also means sacrificing your own interests uh, for the sake of the uh, the larger. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, so we get we get the knowledge of the ideas or the or the, the world of ideas. We get that knowledge intuitively, I presume, not through some other sources. Or I mean, the, if we disagree, for example, about what what the ideal man should be. Uh, how do we settle that dispute? How do we settle that disagreement? Is there an external source that can tell us that it can tell us what the truth is? Well, um, um, it is uh, instinctive, but not everybody has the same uh, spiritual development, and this is right. why you have the church uh, or the you know religious institutions to guide you, because they have. Uh, you know, in their history, sages and, you know, wise people who have thought about these matters and discussed them. And so you go to them for, for guidance. And uh, this is the importance of religion and the importance also of keeping the church always close to the state. Because as I said, uh, you know, the monarch was always a kind of priest and the two offices cannot be separated. And they are the source. Uh, that will, you know, inspire lesser individuals, people who are not so developed as they are, um, uh, or don't have, you know, a complete intuition because they are some kind of um, spiritual geniuses or something of the sort. So uh, all of this is the importance of tradition. This is what traditionalism means, uh, to get a larger view of, uh, of yourself, uh, of your nation, and of... Uh, of the universe um, than the ones that you have. On the other hand, now everybody <laughs> is getting smaller and smaller through technology. You know, the machines may be improving at a rapid rate, but the mind is not. Right.
So, uh, so we now have sort of uh, we've discussed a bit of what caused the problems, why we ended up in the ruins that that he talked about after the Second World War, etc., and 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 what the what the right must accomplish uh, with with um, sort of getting rid of this bourgeois mentality in society or bourgeois ideals i guess in society and get back to an aristocratic ideals uh but what what practical steps uh does he advocate what how can we get from here to there because we're obviously in a very difficult situation with with <laughs> all the, the the power blocks i mean in his time of course it was uh the, the east and and the west with liberalism right. and communism but, but what did? can we do Yes. No, we have to have this uh, new orientation, first of all, in our thought. We cannot be satisfied with video games and uh, Hollywood uh, media and, uh, you know, the press, which is organized by uh, two or three um, Jewish uh, uh, press magnates. So uh, we know what we have to do. The question is, how do you change the, the, the talk, which is where the uh, you know change can happen or should happen. Uh, for this, uh, uh, main fields to alter are academics and uh, politics. Obviously, these are the most important fields. Uh, and also uh, the fields of culture, when you consider society uh, at large. So um, now he points to uh, the strategy of subversion adopted by uh, the elders of Zion. Uh, he calls them that, but uh, we know whom he means, and the Freemasons and so on. And uh, he points to uh, you know the popularity, rising popularity of uh, you know Marxist thought and Darwinian. And even Nietzsche, Nietzsche uh, thought he considers uh, as uh, nihilistic. Uh, I would say Nietzsche is not just nihilistic, he's uh, a very dangerous kind of uh, thinker because he's very amoral, as you probably know. He's against uh, you know, any uh, discussion of morality uh, in, uh, in terms of the new man that he is trying to um, usher in. So anyway, Nietzsche is included an all existentialist philosophy that would include Heidegger in particular, uh, who's gained such a lot of popularity these days. And you will hear him discussed in the new right as if he were you know, a very important thinker. In fact, he's a very obscure thinker. And nobody really understands him because he you know, has his own uh, terminology and so on, uh, all concocted by himself. And then uh, existentialism is uh, is not, Idealism. It, this is not the original trend of German philosophy. Uh, it stops with fascism and then comes this existentialism, which is about uh, you know uh, our being in this world and so on. Fine, we know we are in this world and we don't need any help from any philosophers on uh, what we see around us. Um, so um, Heidegger also, and then psychoanalysis, which is Freud and um, surrealism and all of that. And all of this keeps dragging uh, mankind further and further down into the subconscious. The subconscious is the opposite of uh, super consciousness, if you like. It is the mirror image of it and the uh, negative uh, uh, reflection of it. So there's no need to delve into the subconscious and, and bring it up into the surface and make it uh, you know, the object of studies um, in psychology or philosophy or art and so on and so on. All of this uh, is degenerate in the sense that it subverts the old world, which was idealistic and, and focused on uh, the prime uh, reality, which is uh, spiritual, not material at all. So uh, all of these uh, you know, uh, disciplines that he points to uh, can be corrected in universities if they're no longer studied so extensively. Um, that would be a reformation of the universities at, at that level. Someone must uh, be willing to do this. It must uh, be some dean of a university or the head of a uh, faculty and so on. He must uh, you know, exercise this discrimination. 
And in politics, of course, uh, they have to be excluded completely because their tendency is uh, further and further downward because capital uh, uh, can only s survive by itself at the expense of uh, the rest of the world. And this is uh, its evil. Right. So, so um, does he believe that we can achieve change through through politics, through political parties, or or more by other other means, subversion, etc.? Well, he is not a democrat. Uh, uh, political parties are part of uh, democratic processes, and he is not really interested in that. So he uh, only suggests that you know you have to. Uh, Cultivate uh, your own interests in your own way, and uh, you know, know the direction you have to take. But I don't think he uh, placed much value on uh, democratic parties. Uh, um, I suppose you you could get a party that is uh, very independent of the current financial forces and so on, uh, and that might make a difference. But uh, it would have to be, uh, uh, you know, completely. Um, uh, uh, independent in the sense that there must be no infiltration of subversive forces because once they come in, then uh, that'll be the end of that party and the end of uh, another, uh, you know, attempt <laughs> to change things uselessly. So it, it has to take uh, uh, a, a small band of people. He is always placing great importance on menabunda, that is, uh, bands of men men connected to each other like the knights of the past uh, or you know the monks of the church and so on uh, it has to be uh, a male kind of grouping uh, this is very clear in him because he, he does not think that politics is a, a field for women uh, the state can only be directed by men and uh, society can include women of course but uh, anyway, uh, these uh, groupings of men should constitute what he calls the order. Uh, the order sounds uh, somewhat strange because uh, there were, I think, uh, far-right groups in America called the New Order or something, and they were all banned and this and that. Anyway, he used the term also, the order. It is like a nightly grouping, and they you know, are devoted to the state and uh, politics, and only they will uh, will be allowed to to run uh, the government. So, um, if you don't have that, uh, uh, and you have only the present democratic uh, constitutional bodies, then you have to focus on the upper houses. Uh, this is the uh, House of Lords or the Senate, and so on and so forth. And somehow the people there have to uh, you know fo focus uh, all of their efforts in regaining power a power that they lost uh, in the 17th century or something but he uses the term apoliteia right right what 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 is what does that what does he mean by that um well i mean uh, i suppose uh, it, it's a kind of um, spiritual uh, interpretation of politics, I would say, uh, because right. his focus is always spiritual. And, and every power that exists is divine in its original source and must continue to uh, radiate that uh, essence, as it were. So right. he uh, has uh, you know, a view of uh, the state as a transcendental state. Uh, Gentile also talks of the transcendental state. Uh, what is transcendental state? One knows transcendental meditation from India, you know, and here's the state which is transcendental. So you can see the similarities in thought between uh, these uh, very different uh, uh, schools of philosophy. Uh, idealistic philosophy always has this uh, larger dimension to it. So, um, and this transcendental state then, uh, you know, has its own. Uh, sources of power, uh, so the monarch, you know, uh, rules uh, because of this power, any leader must. And um, so, um, let's see. 
Um, right. So, but but what what does that mean in this context? I mean, uh, in, in a more everyday uh, in a more everyday context, uh, the transcendent and the transcendental. But he means something more specific than that, right? He has a very specific meaning when he talks about the the transcendental state, right? Right. What what, uh, what does that mean? I, I, I mean, for 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 a, a viewer who isn't familiar with the term. Right. Actually, uh, a transcendental state is a state that uh, is uh, the embodiment of um, the wills, the personalities of all of its members. That is, uh, it is a kind of superman. Uh, Nietzsche talked about the superman, but the state in fascist philosophy assumes that position. And uh, so, it, it, it is something that is larger than the individual and uh, takes care of everybody in a kind of harmonious whole, as the cosmos also is actually a harmonious whole. It's not a chaos. Now, I was going to say, and I was uh, distracted, that this transcendental state also elevates uh, the notion of nationalism. Uh, you know, nationalism uh, is brought up these days uh, very frequently uh, in a populist sort of manner. There are many populist movements in Europe uh, at the moment. And um, these pass for right-wing movements or something. Actually, this nationalism is democratic because it's populist. And then um, nationalism itself is not sufficient because this transcendental state also you know, can unite many nations uh, in uh, a larger whole. This is what the empire is did. So imperium is a higher form than nationalism. And of course, you know, uh, the Habsburg Empire was an ideal kind of empire because it was Catholic and encompassed many different countries in Europe and Mexico and so on. Um, and the Prussians also and the Russians. So all of these are large groupings above the nation. All of this comes from this idea of a transcendental state, uh, which, which uh, you know, is something divine, as it were, because everything in such a state uh, is infused with divine power. And uh, even though he discounts the value of the Catholic Church, uh, I don't think uh, he, he could do that so easily because he also likes the Habsburg Empire very much, and that was a Catholic Empire. So you will see that uh, this uh, divine, uh, sorry, religious aspect of the state must never be forgotten. Actually, if you go to the Hofburg in Vienna, uh, you will see uh, many fabulous um, um, salons and rooms belonging to Sisi and so on and so forth, the, uh, the uh, Austrian princess. And then when you go to Franz Josef's, uh, bed chamber. You'll see it's so very simple. It's just a simple cot uh, with the crucifix or something above it. And he was the emperor of the Habsburg, which is a very, you know, uh, enormous kind of empire. So that religious aspect of politics uh, is the transcendental aspect. Of right. It. So, okay. Um, so let's move on to uh, another thing that he says. He says here that, and this is a continuation of that, he starts chapter two in, in this book, he says, the foundation of every true state is the transcendent transcendence of its own principle, namely the principle of sovereignty, authority, and legitimacy. Um, should we say something about that? He also says here that, the state is not the expression of society. The state is under the masculine aegis, while society is under the feminine aegis. So the, these terms would obviously seem kind of nebulous for for anyone uh, approaching this for the first time. So how would um, how could we explain those things? What does he mean by that? Well, society is based on the family, and the family includes. Uh, the woman, she uh, actually is in charge of the family. Uh, you know, economics uh, is also uh, the charge of women. Uh, it's women who are concerned uh, with the distribution of funds for the maintenance of the family and so on, while the man works. So economics, uh, society, the family, all of these are 
the realms of women. But statecraft is different, as I've uh, tried to uh, highlight. It is something higher. It has a higher orientation, and this is uh, the divine. And this can be only um, maintained by men, because uh, men have uh, that uh, direction, uh, naturally, biologically, and so on and so forth. This has always been the case. And uh, will continue to be so. Um, this also is related to Indian uh, mythology, or Indo-European, if you like, with which uh, Evola must have been familiar. And that is uh, the first manifestation of the divine soul through desire is as a cosmic man called Purusha uh, in India. And this is, uh, um, of course, uh, reflected in the Celtic tradition of the wicker man. The wicker man is a giant uh, straw man or something filled with uh, you know sacrificial victims and that sort of thing okay and the whole of the cosmos evolves through a sacrifice of this cosmic man and so on uh, and all of our sacred rituals the brahmanical rituals are uh, attempts to restore this uh, cosmic man to his original splendor the, these are the you know external manifestations of what we should be doing uh, spiritually ourselves. So uh, anyway, Purusha, that is man. Uh, you have that idea also uh, in the Hebrew Bible, which briefly refers to Adam. Adam means man. And uh, the Kabbalah knows that this is not just a man in some garden in Yemen, Aden or something, but it's really a cosmic figure. So uh, all of this uh, comes from the idea of man, uh, a real uh, cosmic man, if you like, uh, but ideal, um, ideal also in the sense that uh, it embraces the whole uh, universe. So only uh, you know men are capable of this vision, and uh, women don't play much of a part in this uh, in this ritual or in this politics. Um, it's not about society, it's about the higher dimensions of it uh, embodied in the state. Okay, right. So um, let's let's talk about another concept because he uses many of these concepts in, in, a, in a very specific way. And one of those concepts is tradition that um, Ebola talks about often in, in all of his books probably, uh, most of them at least, he talks about tradition. So, but the, this is not tradition in the sense of the everyday use of the word. Uh, he says, among other things, he says, those who stand upright in the world of ruins are at a higher level. Their, watch, their watchword is tradition. So, I mean, what, what is this tradition? Is it just what came from the past or is, is it something else? Is there a difference, for example, between tradition and conservatism? Well, tradition, uh, as I have uh, outlined it, is the aristocratic world to which he belonged and uh, which has been destroyed, you know, at the end of the uh, two wars. So this is the traditional world uh, where there was a church uh, and a state and, and uh, they ruled different nations uh, in, through different empires. And uh, so that, that is the traditional world. And as I have tried to point out, there is a, a, a universality about uh, this kind of traditionalism because you find the same concepts in Platonic philosophy, in Indian philosophy, and so on. They're all part of the same idealistic system, and this is the traditional world. Um, so uh, it's not something so uh, esoteric or anything. It, it could be if you are going to be a priest uh, in India or, or in um, the Vatican or wherever. But uh, you can also see it manifest in the political life of nations. Uh, until this great catastrophe of the early 20th century, put an end to all of that. So what we have now is a very unnatural kind of state and uh, society. So uh, this is what he means by returning to tradition. Right. So uh, one thing that that we 
that we mentioned briefly in the beginning of this conversation was was democracy and uh, and the, you said that Ebola he criticized both fascism and national socialism for being too democratic and he repeatedly rejects fascism and national socialism for being mass movements but i mean how, how is he how does he su suppose that we are supposed to gain political influence without recruiting the masses in our society uh, so i mean right. how can this be transferred to reality so it doesn't just become a a, a sort of a thought experiment or a, so a a source of escapism that it actually has some some real consequences can we elaborate on that right. Right. As I said, Gentile is a lot more democratic in this regard because uh, he um, maintained <laughs> that fascism really represents uh, all of uh, the people. Uh, there is actually no difference between the people and the state. The state uh, is the people and the people are the state. And you have the same uh, idea reflected in uh, Germany, Ein Volk, uh, Ein Reich, Ein Führer as if all the people were the same as the empire uh, or the Third Reich and the same as, uh, as Hitler or Mussolini in, in the case of Italy. This kind of identification uh, is somewhat unrealistic because not everybody you know, is committed to the state uh, and the leader uh, overnight. So he prefers you know, uh, a more uh, individual kind of education on the part of the people. Uh, and his aim is to extract a core of men who will constitute this order, which will reform uh, politics. So uh, he is very aristocratic in that sense. Uh, he complained about Gentile's, uh, you know, a fusion of uh, the people and the state as if the two were the same, uh, as being somewhat too democratic. Um, and Gentile also uh, simply. Uh, you know, um, acknowledges work, work itself uh, as a very important element uh, of life and something uh, to, to, to be uh, commended. Whereas he sees work always uh, as just uh, the instrument of economics and uh, always uh, liable to uh, degeneration and so on, as it's happening now. Because all of these uh, technocrats and so on are simply industrial workers and they place so much importance on their work. It is not important to do so much work and to produce so many useless products, you know, and so he insists on a more uh, ascetic, a conservative society that does not spend all its time in consumption uh, and production and consumption and this endless cycle, you know, of desire and thirst. So uh, he's a very aristocratic and ascetic kind of, uh, philosopher. So um, I, I would suggest that, you know, uh, one try to follow him. Even if one cannot, one should know that what one sees around one is not conservatism uh, or, you know, nationalism or anything, because all of this is in the service of capital, you know, in different forms, whether it's communism or, uh, or Americanism or whatever. It's all for the stock exchange. And it's the opposite. It's the opposite of uh, the aspirations of an idealist. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very powerful. The vision is powerful. But but uh, I guess my point is that uh, if you actually want to compete for power, uh, you have to play that game. And and uh, I mean, mm -hmm. if if he no, if he criticizes the 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 people at the time the national socialists and the fascists for playing that game uh, i sort of get the impression that it's a bit of escapism uh, if you get my point well you see um, um hitler and mussolini tried to do this uh, by virtue of their charismatic personalities and they actually succeeded in gaining power so it is possible for a leader who has you know uh, uh, the interests of the state uh, at heart to actually um, uh, take control and reform uh, politics and society and so on. But uh, whether it can transform the people at the same time 
uh, you know, uh, very quickly is another question. And this is why democratic processes are not always successful, uh, as we have seen from the experience of the Second World War. Uh, his uh, uh, alternative suggestion is that, you know, you develop, uh, uh, you know, these groups uh, of men who have lofty um, aspirations and then work with those groups to, to, to achieve a new kind of ruling class or ruling caste. And um, that, that is the only way to do it. And it, it is possible, as I suggested, you know, if you can reform uh, the universities by, you know, getting professors who do not uh, accept uh, this kind of literature as uh, you know, worthy of study, and do not disseminate this kind of uh, literature in the universities, um, then you will already have discrimination at a higher level. It can be done, but must be done at a higher level always. Um, so you know, uh, it may take time, or you can get you know a, a dictator suddenly appearing uh, who is very aristocratic. Uh, I don't see any such person. Uh, around me, but it's not impossible. So these are the ways, but always the reformation should come from the top. The masses are not going to do anything by themselves, as I said. I mean, they're always in the service of the bourgeoisie. This is the dangerous right. middle caste in between. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we briefly mentioned this, but the, the uh, there are there is some evidence that uh, you know the the SS he because he was in Germany uh, also and and the SS made made statements they for example they made a statement saying that Ebola is a reactionary dreamer and a dilettante from the old upper class um, so I mean was he just a reactionary dreamer or or no he or was a real did he actually player. have right. He was, as I have tried to show, he was a real aristocrat. His thoughts are some of the most aristocratic uh, in the early 20th century literature of political philosophy. Um, and uh, national socialism has the same uh, defect that uh, fascism in Italy had, even Gentile uh, had, in thinking that all of the people can somehow be made overnight uh, idealistic. Uh, you know, this is not possible. And um, the elevation of the German people as a whole, you know, into some kind of um, superior uh, population was all very rushed. And uh, of course, National Socialism uh, was also very practical in the sense that they focused immediately on the Jews and Freemasons and so on and excluded them straight away from all uh, social and academic and political life. So you can say that they, uh, were very, very pragmatic also. And um, Evola was not a politician in the first place. So you can't really say that uh, he was a dreamer because he wasn't really uh, enforcing policy or making it. So uh, comparison is unjust. He's a political thinker and a philosopher. So this is what he suggests. Now, if you get a person like Hitler, uh, you know, then you can actually do something about changing mm -hmm. uh, all of the society and uh, the state itself. Uh, but of course, one defect of both National Socialism and uh, Fascism uh, is that they think that you know the entire population can be converted uh, in an idealist direction overnight. That That is, of course, not possible. So you need you know to have a stronger state and so on in that regard. Whereas Evola is gentler and he says, you know, uh, the masses cannot be uh, reformed. Uh, you just have to uh, cultivate yourself so that you form a grouping that is superior and then, you know, lead into a, another direction that is followed by others or that you can direct later. Right. Well, I, I want to ask you uh, another question that's not directly about this book, perhaps, but, but about... Uh, you know, your experiences, your studies and everything, and because you've written about Alfred Rosenberg, and I know that the two men uh, knew of each other and they commented on each other, uh, Ebola and Rosenberg. Uh, 
and, and I find both men very interesting. Can you say something about the differences between the two? Or did they comment on each other? Did they, did they have something to say about, uh, you know, the, the, philo the, the respective philosophies of each other? Well, I mean, um, Rosenberg is also a, a kind of neo-medievalist. Uh, Ebola also goes back to the Middle Ages, you know, as the strongest uh, example of uh, the old European tradition, uh, the feudal tradition and so on. And Rosenberg, uh, you know, wrote about the uh, about the knights, the uh, Teutonic knights and everything. So uh, he had a focus mostly on the German uh, part of Europe, whereas Evola had a greater interest uh, in Rome, the Roman Empire. Uh, that is also interesting, actually. Um, and he was also against uh, the glorification of the Nordic race, which was common among the National Socialists. And he believed that, you know, the Romans uh, were earlier uh, than the Germans and superior to them. Uh, so whatever it is, uh, he was also against this biological view of race that became uh, very complicated in the National Socialist regime, where there were scientists you know, <laughs> investigating different races and their capacities and so on, in some times ho horrible ways in the concentration camps and so on. Right, so that uh, he was against. Uh, generally, uh, under him, the national socialism became you know, a, a, a very race oriented um, sort of scientific exploration into race and so on and so forth, which Ebola was not in agreement with. So um, that certainly is a major difference. And of course, uh, the Germans uh, during the Reich always insisted on their superiority. It was uh, a German Reich and uh, every country that they uh, took control of, they had their own people as rulers, right? As governors and so on. So all of this uh, is a little difficult. Uh, but, uh, you know, at least the National Socialists tried, tried to recreate Europe in a different way, um, in more traditional uh, forms. But um, maybe it was a little too uh, literal in its application. Its, right. Uh, I do. Yeah. So, um, I guess... Um, I, I want to ask you also what Ebola's views on Christianity were. I mean, did he see Christianity as part of the problem or part of the solution? Did he see it as a part of the decline of the West or or, or uh, the, the sort of a part of the solution for the West? Where did he place Christianity? Well, he, he doesn't see Christianity as uh, the source of uh, the uh, degeneration. It's Capitalism uh, uh, in Italy itself, that is the uh, the um, um, uh, Florentine uh, ruling families and so on, they were all capitalists. But uh, I dis disagree with them because I think that the Medici are not uh, like the Rothschilds or anything. They, they were Italian, um, you know, uh, aristocrats virtually and they supported the arts and the renaissance the revival of learning uh, greek and ancient roman learning in the renaissance is is due to them the renaissance uh, the, these uh, wealthy families of italy so he points to the renaissance i would say the reformation is uh, really the source of the problem and okay. it's individualist uh, tradition he doesn't talk so much about it so um, in any case, uh, he talks about the Catholic Church in this Men Among the Ruins uh, in the last uh, chapters. And he says it has, you know, uh, it has changed from being a spiritual power in, into a socialist power. It's more interested in, uh, you know, helping uh, third world uh, countries and that sort of thing, or with the people there, than in uh, supporting the state uh, in its supreme authority, its supreme sovereignty, and so on. That is, it should re represent the source of the power of the state. 
and it is not doing that. But that is not the fault of the church. I mean, the separation of the church and the state occurred, you know, quite early already in in America um, and England, virtually at the same time. That is due to the Protestant uh, revolutions, the Glorious Revolution, then the American Revolution, and then the French Revolution, and socialism, and so on. So, so I mean, you can't blame Christianity so much as uh, the politics that itself has turned against religion. You know. Right. Um, we got a question from the audience here um, regarding Protestantism. You say that Protestantism is, is, is a major cause of the problem, uh, the Protestant Reformation. But what about countries, what about Prussia, for example? Um, right. Well, everybody so admires Prussia because uh, it is, uh, you know, a shining example of uh, a well-run state. And that is because uh, it had the Hohenzollerns, that is the, the German rulers uh, throughout, uh, until Wilhelm and so on and so forth. And they represent tradition. And they were originally Catholics, actually. And they were responsible for the, uh, you know, uh, transformation of Poland into a Catholic state. It was, uh, it was not that originally. Uh, so uh, the, the Prussians are really originally Catholic and they just follow the traditions. They had a nightly, class and then of course because of the germanic character which has to be acknowledged they were very very disciplined so uh, you know the prussian state was uh, a shining kind of uh, machine that worked uh, splendidly where this devotion to the state uh, and the dynasty the Hohenzollerns, was evident throughout even in the bureaucracy normally you think of bureaucracy as a waste of time but they were all, you know, disciplined and systematic. And even the industrialists, uh, the German industrialists, were all uh, devoted to the state. It's the continuation of the feudal mentality. So, right, that is originally Catholic, you know. So it's not due to Protestantism. It was due to the European Catholic tradition from the Middle Ages. So... Um... Um, I guess one of the final <clears throat> topics that that I want to bring up anyway is what what is his uh, his view on um, on on the Jewish role? You said that you disagree with him on on that point. So what was his view on uh, on Jews? Right, he does talk about the protocols. Um, first, he uh, you know thought they were authentic, and then he. Uh, agreed with other people that uh, it is uh, probably a forgery and so on and so forth. But then he uh, insisted that, uh, you know, it reflects the reality of their operations. And uh, so uh, he he says they are generally subversive if this is how they, they uh, operate. But he does not want to be very harsh on the Jews. And he says, well, they represent the third estate, you know, uh, par excellence. And... Uh, uh, we know that, and they control uh, finances and so on. But he says that they too cannot be uh, identified uh, as the, uh, you know, arch villains because there is a fourth estate which communism tried to encourage, and that is the proletariat, and they may eventually uh, be a threat even to the third estate of, of the bourgeoisie. The, the Jews, particularly, and so he, he does not, you know, see them as the ultimate evil, as it were. There is this uh, fourth estate. This is the industrial proletariat, which could equally be dangerous. So the very last chapter is about demographics and the problem of, you know, mass migration and this and that and the other, uh, ruining uh, uh, traditional cultures. But we can see that all of this mass migration is due to, you know, the interests of capital in, in getting more, uh, you know, cheap labor and that sort of thing. And uh, so I have a different view, of course, than Ebola, certainly what he expressed. But he says, you know, you can't identify them as the only culprits. Uh, there are other dangers lurking in the masses uh, that is, uh, you know, these large hordes uh, coming from different countries and that sort of thing. So um, that that's his uh, uh, shading of the uh, problem. Right. It's somewhat nuanced. 
Right, yes. So um, we've gone for about an hour and 10 minutes, and we've right. covered uh, several aspects of, of this book. Is there anything else you want to bring up about Men Among the Ruins or, or uh, Julius Evola in general? Well, I would suggest that uh, people read this book um, seriously. Uh, it is not uh, a work by an eccentric um, esotericist uh, or anything. Uh, he's a real aristocrat with real aristocratic ideas. And in uh, conjunction with this, they should also read the other work uh, he published, which is uh, Ride the Tiger, which is uh, one of his last works, I think, 1960 or 61 or something. And that one uh, focuses on all of the, the uh, intellectual um, uh, strands in Western uh, thought and academics that are subversive. And this includes, you know, all of this Nietzsche and uh, Heidegger and, and um, Freud and so on and so forth, and uh, detailed discussions of them. And I think uh, one should read that because that gives you uh, a view of what is happening in modern society where pseudo intellectual fashions are being propagated as conservatism or German thought, simply because they have a German name or something, you know. Not everything <laughs> that has a German name is really uh, German. So uh, that is very important uh, for intellectuals in particular. And as I said, you know, the reformation of uh, academics uh, is uh, a primary concern. So I think it would be useful for those who have intellectual interests uh, to read that uh, along with this. Right. Excellent. Uh, let me just see if I don't think we have any more questions from the audience. Let me just take a, a last look. Uh, let me see here. I don't believe so. So um, I think this has been a, a, an excellent conversation, a good introduction to Julius Evola. And uh, for the next episode in this series of First Principles, we're going to be talking to uh, George Bordy and Kat. We're going to talk a, about. Uh, revolt against the modern world, which is probably regarded as Julius Evola's magnum opus. So that's going to be a lot of fun and, and very interesting. So, um, Alexander Jacob, this has been a pleasure. Uh, do you have any final words? Um, no. Um, I hope the listeners have benefited somehow from the discussion. I'm sure they have. Do you want to? Is there anything uh, that you want to plug that you want to sort of advertise where where they can find your work uh, before we hang up? Well, um, I don't know. I have a YouTube channel with some videos, uh, and um, I have a small website, uh, but it mostly has my books. My books can be found on Amazon, I think, mostly, and. Uh, they're not very difficult to find if right. people have an interest in uh, early 20th century politics. Very good. So um, thank you so much for that. Let's just go over some uh, links here. You can find our website on guide to culture.org. And you can find us on Twitter, real underscore GTK for guide to culture. You can find our archive of previous episodes on BitChute. I think those are the most important links and of course if you want to help the channel please share our links so that other people can find the archive especially so i want to thank everyone who's been watching i want to thank the chat and i want to thank the moderators and especially i want to thank you alexander jacob uh, this has been a great conversation and we'll be back on tuesday with ty e again we're going to talk about ken russell's film from 1971 uh the devils so that's going to be a great conversation, and I'm looking forward to that. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.